Good? You guys say good, but you look defeated. <laughs> how, how are the midterms? Are most of them over? No? Oh, are you guys in the thick of it right now? What do you guys have left? All of them. You guys already wrote one for this class. Uh, so what would you guys be taking? 372? You guys done 372? Next week. Next week? Ugh. <laughs> That's not nice. What else? 391? That's this week? Oh, okay. 381? No? 330? Next week, two weeks. What is it? 315? What's transportation? 315? That transportation was mean. Who'd you guys have for transportation? Ah, uh, yeah. When I took transportation, that was the longest exam ever. Longest exam ever. Only one person finished. It was my friend. I said, how the hell did you finish that exam? I said, I'd have pooped so bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because it's true. You, you work pretty fast when you have to go. <laughs> All right, referring to this class, because you guys say that you're doing good, so I'll trust you guys, even though I don't quite believe it. This is a special day. Today is lecture 10, and out of this class, we test you guys on 20 lectures. So today marks the halfway point, the halfway point. Isn't that crazy? Halfway point through a semester already. How's, the, how's this class been so far? How are the lectures? Lectures are good. How are the assignments? Pretty fair, okay. How is the midterm? Okay, is there anything that can be improved? One thing that students don't really realize is that as instructors, professors, whatever, we're here to help you guys learn. We're here to help you guys learn. If you guys have suggestions to make things better, let us know. I know some don't really seem receptive to criticism, but trust me, it helps. You have no idea how, I don't want to say scared, but how much your USRIs at the end of the semester, how much they influence those. Now, you guys are going to get kind of a, a mid-semester USRI. It's not an official USRI. They, the faculty gave it to us as kind of a, hey, if you want it, here you go, just to see how you guys are doing with hybrid delivery. So if you guys want to fill it out, by all means, please list any suggestions. It, of course, is anonymous. You guys don't have to worry about it. But if you guys don't want to fill it out and you guys want to wait for the official USRI at the end of the semester, you guys can do that too. But again, all I want from you guys is just to be honest. Tell me what we can improve. Again, this course is for you guys. You guys are our future engineers. I want you all to feel equipped with all the knowledge you guys need. All right? So I'm hoping that the goals of this class are clear. That's something when I took this class, it, I, I didn't feel it was too clear. I came out of this class thinking, what did I just learn? <laughs> uh, that's why I try my best as a structural engineer to actually show you guys what we use it for. That's my goal at least. Today, uh, it's not going to be the best lecture because <laughs> it's a lot of derivations. Momentum balance is something that's kind of an add-on to stress. If stress was the main game, momentum balance is the DLC, okay? That's what we're dealing with. What we're going to do today is we're going to discuss two things. The balance of linear momentum, which you guys have seen before. You guys just haven't seen it in this form. And the balance of angular momentum. So basically, this lecture is going to come down to two proofs. That's it, two proofs. You guys don't need to know the proofs, as always. The only thing you guys need to know is the resulting equations. We're going to come up with two objectives. The balance of linear momentum, that is going to give us our equilibrium equations. All right, our equilibrium equations. The balance of angular momentum, well, that's just a proof that a stress tensor is symmetric. All this time I showed you guys that a stress tensor, I said it was symmetric, but we didn't prove it. The balance of angular momentum proves it. Balance of angular momentum, though, is not going to be very nice, all right? So I'm, I'm warning you guys now. Is there any questions or concerns before we jump into momentum balance? This marks a big shift. Next lecture and next week, we're going to start talking about constitutive laws. 
how can we relate stress and strain together? That's where all the fun comes in, all right? So once you guys know this, you guys are good to go. So momentum balance, if there's no questions, we'll get started. So all this comes from two people, Newton and Euler. They came together, they used their big brains, and they created everything for solid mechanics, basically. Now, we're gonna start off with Newton. Newton's very famous because he said the sum of the forces is equal to what? Sum of the forces is equal to what? Mass times acceleration, I know. It's, it's 8 a.m., we'll get there together. So Newton's second law of motion states that the rate of change of linear momentum of an object with respect to time is equal to the net force on the object. Is that mass times acceleration? What do you guys think? You guys just said it's mass times acceleration. I said it's the change of linear momentum with respect to time. Is that the same thing? Yes. Who can prove it? No one. You're just assuming it's the same thing. But it is. Basically, the sum of the forces on an object is the derivative of mass times velocity. Now, in most of our scenarios, does mass change? No. Mass is constant. Mass cannot be created or destroyed, that kind of thing, until you get to atomic bombs, but we'll only leave that alone. So if mass is typically constant, is it going to be affected by the time derivative? No. So what we can do is we can rearrange it so we have mass times the derivative of velocity. What's the derivative of velocity? Of course, it's going to be acceleration. So this is the formula you guys are known, or is known to you guys. So this is what Newton stated right here. Now in solid mechanics, this wasn't really applied until Euler came along. As we're going to see, most of solid mechanics comes from two people, Newton and Lagrange. Or not Newton, Euler and Lagrange. Euler dealt a lot with solid mechanics, physical bodies, compressed, stuff like that. Lagrange dealt more with fluids. As I said, this course is continuum mechanics, but it's more so solid mechanics. Continuum mechanics refers to both solid mechanics as well as fluid mechanics, but have we done any fluid mechanics? Not really, no. You guys are learning, I guess, a little bit of it in 330, but not really in this course. So this came from Newton right here. Now, Euler was the genius that extended this right here to a continuum by introducing two laws. Two laws. First is the balance of linear momentum. Who knows what this means? No, this is essentially though, our equilibrium equations for a continuum. And if we look, we know some of the things. What is Tn? What was Tn? You guys remember from last slide? Exactly, that's our traction vector and we're integrating it over the surface of our continuum. We have body forces, which we integrate over the volume of our continuum. And this, of course, has to be equal to the change in linear momentum. That's all this is saying. Are we going to use this equation in this form? No. We're going to simplify it to make it easier. But for the general case of the continuum, this is the balance of linear momentum. Now, the second one is the balance of angular momentum. So again, it's a very ugly, disgusting equation. This looks like something you see straight out of Wikipedia. Do you guys ever got lost and tried to Wikipedia something and you see their equations and it just looks disgusting? That's these right here. So these are the actual two equations <coughs> applied to a continuum, but we're going to simplify it because, well, let's be honest, these look gross. None of you guys want to have to deal with these. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the balance of linear momentum. Now, all the balance of linear momentum is going to do for us is it's going to create our three equilibrium equations. That's it, our three equilibrium equations. So if we have a cube here, we know that there are forces acting on the cube, on the surface of the cube. Do you guys agree with that? If I were to take a cube, it's going to have internal stresses on each face 
of the cube. We know that it's going to look something like this. If we were to simplify these stresses into a single vector, what would that vector be? What's that vector called? If I were to take all three of these stresses and simplify it into one single vector, who remembers? No one? Our traction vector, all right? So if we were to simplify all these into just a single force, that'd be our traction vector. But all you guys need to know right now is each face has three different stress components. Now, something we didn't really talk about was there's, oh, I guess we'll talk about this before. <clears throat> and something we haven't talked about is the stress throughout our cube changes. If I were to look at the internal forces on this side of the podium and compare it to this side, are they going to be the same? No. Think of your just big long beam, distributed load. We know that the moment profile is kind of a nice problem, right? It changes throughout the beam. Well, same with the stresses. So on one side, we have stress sigma 1, 1. And then on the other side, we have sigma 1, 1 plus the change in sigma 1, 1 over the distance. So notice how this right here is the thickness of the cube. So the change in the stress over the thickness. And this is the same for every direction. So this is what we're going to kind of use. Another thing that we have to consider is that our objects have body forces. What's an example? Well, actually, I guess I say it right there. Body forces are forces that act over the volume of a body. It's kind of simple. Best example, gravity. Is this table have gravity on it? Yes, because it keeps falling down. So typically, we would have, for structural applications, a body force in the E2 direction, which would be gravity. For structural applications, do we have a body force in the E1 or the E3 direction? No. Can someone give me a scenario where we would have body forces in the horizontal directions? What do you guys think? Is there a very simple example where we actually would have body forces in horizontal directions? Well, there's some applications, magnets. If I take two magnets, are they going to be attracted to each other? Yes, or repel each other. So that'd be a simple example. Luckily for us, we don't design our structures to rely upon magnetism. That would be a little bit weird. So typically, we only deal with row B2, but it's important in the derivation to consider all the body forces. So what we're going to do is we are going to take that concept and we're going to apply it to Newton's equation of motion. So let's consider all the forces in the E1 direction. So we have three directions, but we're just going to consider the horizontal direction, if you will. We have our cube, and if we were to look in the E1 direction, we know that we have sigma 1, 1, and then we have sigma 1, 1, plus the change in sigma 1, 1 over that thickness, delta x1. Is this our only stress acting in the E1 direction? What do you guys think? Is this our only stress acting in the E1 direction? You guys are saying no? You guys are right. Another thing that we have is, of course, our body force in the direction. But then keep in mind that we also had shear stresses. All right, we also had shear stresses. So at the bottom here, we have sigma 2, 1. And then on the top, we'd have sigma 2, 1 plus the change in sigma 2, 1 over that thickness, dx2, which would be kind of this vertical thickness. And then we have sigma 1, 3 on the back side, and then sigma 3, 1 plus the change times, again, another thickness. So what do you guys think I'm going to do? I essentially created a free body diagram. I listed stresses. What do you think I'm going to do? In Eng 130, after you created your free body diagram, labeled all the forces, what would you typically do? Some of the forces, and that's all we're going to do. I'm going to take some of the forces in this E1 direction. Here's the first trick. Do I have forces? Is sigma 1, 1 a force? Is that Newton's? No, it's a stress. So what I need to do when I take some of the forces 
is I need to divide, or I guess multiply, by its corresponding area. If I want force, it's going to be my stress times the area. So if I were to do that, I get this. And if we look through it, we say, okay, it looks bad, but all I essentially did was just go from component to component. So we have sigma 1, 1. It's acting in the negative direction, so I have a negative. And then the face of this surface on which it acts on, delta x2, delta x3. And I just repeat this process and move on. I got sigma 3, 1. It's going left, so I put a negative. Delta x2, delta x1. It's going to be that surface back there. And then I just go through each one of the components. Now, when we're dealing with this last one, rho b, it's important to note that it doesn't go over a surface. A body force acts over a volume. So I don't just have delta x2, delta x3, something like that. I have delta x1, delta x2, and delta x3. I'm essentially multiplying it over the volume. That's kind of the first trick. Again, you guys don't need to know these derivations. You guys just need to know what comes out at the end. So this is my sum of the forces in the E1 direction. Now, what we're going to do is we are going to simplify this equation because there's some cancellation. I have sigma 1, 1 times delta x2 times delta x3, which is negative. And I have sigma 1, 1 here multiplied by the same thing. They cancel. And I can do this for all of the sigmas. Okay, Getting a little bit nicer, but still not the greatest. So if I were to go to the next slide, this is my resulting equation. Now what's nice is if we were to look here, each one of these is multiplied by the volume. And we know from Newton that this is equal to our mass times our acceleration in that E1 direction. So from here, I'm going to look at this term and say, okay, my mass times acceleration, I can rewrite that as my density multiplied by my volume times acceleration, where my volume is equal to delta x1, delta x2, delta x3. Are you guys bored yet? If you guys said no, you're lying. I'm bored just saying this. <laughs> It's not a lot of fun. So if we were to look, we can substitute that into our equation at the end. And now every term inside of this equation has that volume term. So we can just get rid of it. And this right here is our equation of equilibrium in the one direction. All that build up, and this is what we get. We have the derivative of sigma 1, 1 with respect to x1 plus the derivative of sigma 2, 1 with respect to x2 plus the derivative of sigma 3, 1 with respect to x3, plus rho b is equal to rho a. That's going to be our first equilibrium equation. How many equilibrium equations do we have in three dimensions? Three. If I were to repeat the same process, but instead go E1, or sorry, E2 and E3, I would get my other equations. So if I were to go in the E2 direction, I get the following, E3, I get the following. So all you guys need to know for the balance of linear momentum is you guys get these three equations right here. So if you guys look on assignment four, this is what you got, or I guess assignment five question four, this is what you guys are going to use to solve that question. And you guys can be saying, Clayton, what about component form like this? This doesn't look too nice. I want it simplified. Who wants it simplified? All right, a couple people, joke's on you. It looks even worse when it's simplified. <laughs> so this would be in its component form. We have a summation from j equals one to three, partial sigma j i with respect to x j plus rho b i plus rho a i. I never make you guys use component form in this class. This is more when you're doing graduate level proofs, so you don't have to worry about it. All you guys need to do is look at this right here. And when we apply it, as you're going to see, it's really simple. Remember displacement gradients? I showed you all of those partial derivatives. Everyone, ooh, it's scary. But was it that bad? No. It's the same thing here. All we're doing is we are going into our Cauchy stress tensor and just taking derivatives. So if I were to go sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 1, and sigma 3, 1, is this going to be the row or the column of my Cauchy stress tensor? Sigma 1, 1, 2, 1, and 3, 1. Who thinks it's going to be the first row of my Cauchy stress tensor? 
All right, who thinks it's going to be the first column of my Cauchy stress tensor? It is going to be the first column. So if we look here, one, one, two, one, three, one, that's the first column. That's it. What's nice for us is if we have the Cauchy stress tensor, we have all of these values. We have them. Rho B, well, that's going to be things like gravity. So tech will typically give you them. And this term right here at the end, A, if something is in static equilibrium, static, what is this always going to be equal to? Zero. Exactly. There's no acceleration if things are static. This table's static. It's not flying away, so it's pretty good. So if we look here, it's really gross, but we know all these from the Cauchy stress tensor. We can solve for this. This is typically zero. It's not too bad. Now, if we look here, how many equations do we have? Three, right? Just one, two, three. How many unknowns can we solve for? How many unknowns can we solve for using three equations? There's the trick. It's more than that. Who is in my seminar on, I guess, Tuesday? In the question four of your assignment this week, assignment five, you guys have to use equilibrium to solve five unknowns. What? Five on got three equations, Clayton, and you lost your mind? Here's the trick. These equations have to satisfy every point in a continuum. So if I'm interested in, let's say, four points on my continuum, four points, how many equations do I technically have then? Four points, and each point has three equations. Twelve. So there's the trick. Every point in your continuum must be satisfied by these equations. So it typically happens when you guys have a lot of unknowns and you have an equation of x1, x2, x3, you can substitute any value you want for x1, x2, x3. If it's valid for every point, it must always satisfy. We're going to deal with an example here as well as in the seminar, and you guys will see what exactly I'm talking about. But here's the key. Every point must be satisfied by equilibrium. So that's balance of linear momentum. All I want you guys to take from that, we have three equilibrium equations. Makes for a nice exam question. What does the balance of linear momentum give us? Well, the answer, three equilibrium equations. What about the balance of angular momentum? I already said it at the beginning of the lecture. Let's see if you guys remember. What does this do for us? What is the purpose of the balance of angular momentum in solid mechanics? The symmetry of the stress tensor. We said that a stress tensor, or Cauchy stress tensor, is symmetric. But we never said why. Well, the reason is the balance of angular momentum. So I told you guys to trust me. Make sure you guys listen to this. Yeah, you guys thought I was going to give you a nice midterm too. And I got you. So the Cauchy stress tensor is symmetric, which basically means sigma ij is equal to sigma ji. But again, I never told you guys why it's symmetric. Well, this is because of the balance of angular momentum. So the change in angular momentum, which I called L with respect to time, is equal to the total moment on an object. Looks a little bit crazy, and it is. But if we look at this side, do you guys know how to find the total moment acting on an object if I give you a bunch of forces? Yeah, so that's not bad. Angular momentum, well, it's a little bit different, but it's also not too bad. So what we're going to do is we're going to prove this by taking the summation of the moments around the E3 axis. So I'm not going to use E3. I'm going to go to what you guys like best, X, Y, Z. If I'm taking the summation of moments about the z-axis, z-axis, which plane am I working in? Summation of moments about z, which plane am I working in? x, y. So we're going to go to the most simple example where we're looking in the x, y plane. Any force in the x, y plane is going to create a moment about the e3 or the, the z-axis, if you will. So this is what we are going to do. We're going to first look at the left-hand side. We're going to look at the left-hand side, then we're going to go to the right. But let's look at the first. 
So the angular momentum, it's simply going to be the moment created by the momentum about a point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the moment of angular momentum about point O, my origin over here. That's it. So we know that the angular momentum is going to be delta m v2 multiplied by r1. So r1 and r2 here, they're just the distances to the centroid of our shape. And then we also have delta m times v1 times r2. Seems pretty simple, right? Like it's not too bad. This is going to be the left hand side. But is this the left hand side? I have L, but do I need to do something to L? Take the derivative with respect to time. Who thinks it's going to be really gross? No one? You guys have hope? That's the first mistake. You guys are third years. You shouldn't have hope anymore. If you look here, before we do anything fun, I'm going to take my mass term and I'm going to switch it back to density times volume, and then I'm going to take the derivative. Now, place your bets. Come on, guys. Who thinks it's going to be gross? Who thinks it's going to be nice and easy? Okay, okay, kind of 50 50. <laughs> I didn't even take it, I just put d over dt up front. You guys both lose, <laughs> both answers. The reason why is because as we're going to see later on, this cancels out. So we don't even need to worry about taking the derivative. It cancels out later on. So this right here, dl over dt, this is going to be the left-hand side of my equation. Now we have to look at the right-hand side. And this is where it gets gross. This was the graduate level uh, question for solid mechanics. Uh, prove the symmetry of the stress tensor. That, that was the question. It was worth like 25% of the final exam. And that final exam, you're given a week to do. <laughs> so this is how much fun it is. Because if we look here, remember how many stresses we have acting on each face? Well, every stress that we have, we also have to take a moment for. So it's, it's not very nice. So here's going to be our diagram. I'm going to label my cube as delta x1 as the thickness in the horizontal direction and delta x2 as the thickness in the vertical direction. I've defined two distances just like before to the centroid. And now I got to figure out all the forces acting on this thing. So we know that we have a shear stress. So on one side, uh, sigma 2, 1. On the other side, sigma 2, 1 plus the change in sigma 2, 1. We know that on the other side, we have sigma 1, 2. And then we have sigma 1, 2 plus the change in sigma 1, 2. Yes, and Clay, it's not too bad what we're talking about. Well, then when we look at the horizontal direction, on this side, we have sigma 1, 1 and sigma 3, 1. On this side, we have sigma 1, 1 plus the change in sigma 1, 1. Same thing for sigma 3, 1. And then we also have rho v1. And then, just going through. And then in the vertical direction, it's almost identical. So we have sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 2 up here with the change. And then we have rho b2. So in order to save some space, if I ever go delta sigma, which I did right here, I'm essentially doing what we did before, where it's going to be the derivative uh, multiplied by that distance. I had to do this in this form because I'm just going to run out of room. Because if we look here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 forces. Well, stresses, but we're going to convert them to forces. So we have to take the sum of the moments about all of these about 0.0. It's not going to be nice. Who thinks it's going to be nice? Yeah, no, I'll be honest. It's not going to be nice. Because remember, if we're taking some of the moments, it's a force times a distance. So I have my stress, but then I have to convert that to force, and then I have to multiply it by the distance. So this equation right here, is it nicer than you thought? I hear some, yeah. That's because this is after the simplification, after all the simplification. So as you guys can imagine, those four graduate students who got that final exam question, <laughs> they weren't too happy. I think it was like, four pages and just straight simplify to get to this point. It's, it's really disgusting. But we're going to take this equation and we're going to play around with it a little bit. Because again, this is going to be the right-hand side of that equation in the previous lecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my equilibrium equations that I defined 
in my balance of linear momentum. Remember, linear momentum gives us equilibrium equations. This is the equilibrium equation. We said mass times acceleration is equal to this, and we know that this is actually equal to the time derivative of rho v times v1. So if you guys remember in our derivation of linear momentum, there is at one point we had this right here. Now this is going to be important to us because if we look at the equation we had on the previous slide, it contains every term over here. The only difference is every term is multiplied by R2 in every term. So we can take all those and we can simplify it into this. The time derivative of rho v times velocity 1 times R2, and we have this. This comes from equilibrium equation number 1. I can repeat this process with equilibrium equation 2, and this gets rid of all the other terms, so we're left with this right here. So remember, when we're proving this, we said that we have a left-hand side and a right-hand side. We already found the left-hand side. Well, now we have our right-hand side. So what we're going to do is we're going to equate our two equations, which comes from this, and we're left with this. And this is why I didn't take that time derivative, because as we can see, on one side, we have it, and on the other side, we have it, but the negative version. So we get rid of it. Nice and simple. So if we were to do the balance of angular momentum, we're left with this. Sigma 1, 2 minus sigma 2, 1 times delta V is equal to zero. There's only two ways this equation holds true. The first is if sigma 1, 2 and sigma 2, 1 are the exact same, right? Makes sense. Or the second one is our volume is zero. When I deal with solid mechanics, let's say I want to analyze this table. This table is going to take a beating by the time I'm done with it. Does this have zero volume? No. If you're dealing with something with zero volume, you're just playing with dust. You're not doing anything. So the only way that this holds true for our purposes is if sigma 1, 2 is equal to sigma 2, 1. What does that imply? It implies that our stress tensor is symmetric. If I were to do the exact same thing that I did, except for I'm taking the angular momentum of E1 and E2, well, I can prove the other two. So again, the only thing I want you guys to take away, sigma ij is equal to sigma ji, or our stress tensor is symmetric. That's it. And you guys are saying, hold on, Clayton. I remember a while back, you said that there are some applications where it's not symmetric. And that's true. But I just proved that it has to be symmetric. So if there are cases where it's not symmetric, what was I missing from my derivation? What do you guys think? This is, this is where it gets fun for you guys. Let's go back to kind of the derivation. Where, what did I miss that would make it not symmetric? What do you guys think? This is something, of course, you won't be tested on, but it's a little fun fact. Think about when you guys cut a beam in NG130. You cut a beam, you release its internal forces, right? What internal forces do we have? I heard shear, normal, moment. Do I have normal? Do I have shear? Do I have moment? No. So that's when it becomes non-symmetric, is when we have what we call couple stresses, or we deal with moments at the same time. If I'm taking summation of moments, and I were to have a moment on here, of course it's going to play a role. In solid mechanics, it doesn't really happen unless there's some sort of attraction between particles. So I'm just going to scroll back down. I just want to put this statement here. We're assuming no couple stresses or moment vectors on the surfaces of the cube. Is this a reasonable assumption? What do you guys think? Is this reasonable? No moments. Who thinks it's reasonable? Who thinks that my results will be good to go if I don't assume any moments? No one? So what I'm teaching is pointless? 
it's very reasonable. If you guys were to simulate the table, no problem. This, no problem. Who can think of one scenario, well, it's actually kind of the main scenario where we can't assume this. There's only one real main scenario where we can't do this assumption. Take a, take a wild guess. Biomechanics. When we simulate solid mechanics, is the spine a solid? Yes, it's bone. So when we deal with simulations, of course, we're keeping it to civil, but all the solid mechanics stuff that we talk about, it applies to everything. And that's what Dr. Samer did. One of his specialities was biomechanics. And when I'm dealing with tissue inside of the body, it actually has a couple stresses. Now, when things have couple stresses, everything just becomes really, really gross. It's actually kind of a main area of study right now. It's not properly defined. There's a lot of research going into it. It's just one of those little fun facts to remember. Couple stresses, it's good when we're dealing with inanimate objects, but things like tissue, it all goes out the window. There's a lot of things that actually go out the window when we deal with tissue. One of them is Poisson's ratio. Do you guys know what Poisson's ratio is? We're gonna talk about it, but I'm seeing some nodding, you guys know. If I were to take square, say a piece of paper, and I were to stretch it, pull it, what's gonna to happen to this direction? Is it gonna get smaller or larger? Typically smaller. Is there cases where if I were to pull, this direction expands? What do you guys think? Who thinks that's that's impossible? Clayton, you lost your mind. It's possible. And the best way I'm going to describe it, and this is when we talk about it, because it's going to be a main concept later, is you guys remember those little balls you had as a kid, like the spiky ball that you pull and it expands out? No? Okay, I've really lost my mind. <laughs> I will show you guys, and you guys will see what I mean. But as you guys will see, a lot of the stuff inside of our body, tissue, when you pull it, it actually expands due to the cellular structure. Very interesting. But yeah, we don't need to worry about that in this course. We're keeping it to basically beams because we're civil engineers. Well, are there any environmental people? <laughs> okay, okay, perfect. We're civil engineers. All right, so that's it for the theory. Let's do some examples. The first two examples you're going to see is simple. The whole purpose of momentum balance isn't to really give you guys a hard time. It's to make sure that everything we deal with remains in equilibrium. So again, I just want to ask you guys, we did two derivations, linear momentum, angular momentum. What did linear momentum give us? The equilibrium equations. What did angular momentum give us? Symmetry of the stress tensor. So we're going to look at this equation here. It says if the stress state below is in equilibrium, determine alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And it basically gives us a stress tensor. Now, one of the things that I want to emphasize to you guys, make this very clear, what is these axes? X1, X2, X3, what are those? Are they position vectors? I wrote them as position vectors, but they're not position vectors. Or dealing with equilibrium, these are just variables. Okay? So they're not position vectors. So we're going to go down and say, okay, we have two different ways to approach this problem because we have two different things. The first one is equilibrium equations. So we're going to start off with our equilibrium equations. So I'm going to switch over to pink. I'm going to say, okay, for our first equilibrium equation, and I guess I'll write it uh, right here. We have partial sigma 1, 1 with respect to x1 plus partial sigma 2, oh, waited too long, 2, 1 with respect to x2 plus partial sigma 3, 1 with respect to x3 plus rho b 1 
is equal to m a1. So all we're going to do is take derivatives again. It's the same thing as displacement gradients. It's no different. Now again, I asked you guys, when I'm looking at these, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, are they the rows or is it the column? Column. So all we're going to do is we're going to just look at each entry, take the derivative. So if I'm looking at the first one, sigma 1, 1 with respect to x1, that's going to be the partial derivative of this. What is the partial derivative of 2 with respect to x1? Zero. It's the derivative of a constant. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. We have zero. What is the partial derivative of sigma 2, 1 with respect to x2? So the partial derivative of alpha x2 with respect to x2. Alpha, exactly. So we have plus alpha. And then finally, our last one, the partial derivative of sigma 3, 1, which is delta x3 with respect to x3. So what's this derivative going to be? Delta, exactly. So you guys got this. So we have plus delta. Those are our three partial derivatives. Now the question says static equilibrium, and it also says that our body forces are equal to zero. So if our body forces are equal to zero, this will be plus zero. And if it's static equilibrium, this is going to be equal to zero. So what can we conclude from this equation? What is alpha going to be equal to? Negative delta. So we have alpha. Actually, I'm going to write this in a different color so we can keep track. We know that alpha has to be equal to negative delta. What happens if it's not? Things are not in equilibrium. Our object is moving. That's all it means if it's not. Of course, static equilibrium is one of the main things we civil engineers want. So we want to enforce this. So say, OK, we're off to, off to a good start. Let's go to the second equation. So the second equation, of course, deals with the second column. What is the partial derivative of sigma 1, 2 with respect to x1? With respect to x1. Zero. So I'm going to actually just put equation 1. We'll come down here and we'll go equation 2. You guys said the first one is zero. What are my next two partial derivatives? Zero. Take a derivative of zero, you're going to get zero. doesn't matter what it's with respect to. Zero plus zero. Our body forces are zero, and our acceleration is zero. So what can we conclude from equilibrium equation two? Zero is equal to zero. Absolutely nothing. We, want, we came off to a good start, and things are looking a little bit more rough for us now. So I'm going to delete this, and we are going to move on to our final equilibrium equation, which deals with the last one. So I'm going to come down here and say, okay, we got three. What is going to be the partial derivative of sigma 1, 3 with respect to x1? What's the partial derivative of gamma x2 with respect to x1? Zero. I don't have any x1 terms. So we're going to have zero. If we look at the next two, they're also zero plus zero. And this is, of course, going to be equal to zero. So what can we conclude from this equation? Nothing. This is when you guys start sweating in the exams. Uh-oh. I already did my whole balance of linear momentum, and I just concluded that alpha is negative delta. That's it. So that's the balance of linear momentum. What other tool do we have? Angular momentum. How does that apply to my stress tensor right here? What does that imply my stress, stress tensor must be? Symmetric. So would I be correct, and I'll switch different colors, would I be correct in saying that this term, sigma 1, 2, must be equal to this term, sigma 2, 1? It has to, be. It has to be symmetric. So what we're going to do is I'm going to say, okay, symmetry.
And the first case is we know that sigma 1, 2 has to be equal to sigma 2, 1. And if we look up here, sigma 1, 2 is beta times x2. So we have beta times x2. And this must be equal to alpha times x2. Alpha times x2. So what does this equation tell us? Eta is equal to alpha. Eta is equal to alpha. So we have another relationship. This equation actually tells us more, but we're going to show you guys through the next one. So if we're still dealing with symmetry, then we know that sigma 1, 3 has to be equal to sigma 3, 1. So we have gamma x2 is equal to delta x3. So we have gamma x2 is equal to delta x3. And of course, this is sigma 1, 3 is equal to sigma 3, 1. What does this equation tell us? Gamma x2 is equal to delta x3. What does that tell us? And this is our last equation. If we look up here, if we were to look at sigma 2, 3 and sigma 3, 2, they're zeros. So we can't do anything else. This is what we're left with. Have we solved for anything? No. So what do we do now? Is this question impossible? Am I just trolling you guys at 8.50 in the morning? <laughs> of course not. This is where that key hint comes into play. And I want you guys to always remember this. These equations of equilibrium and symmetry have to be valid for every point in our equilibrium. Every single point. So if I had these two equations that I have right here, they're a function of points. We have x2, we have x2, we have x3. It doesn't matter what I substitute into them. They always have to be valid. Always. So if I were to take this second equation here, and let's switch colors. Let's say that I were to do x2 is equal to 0 and x3 is equal to 1. If I were to do that point, it's valid. That would mean that we have gamma times x2, which was 0, is equal to delta times x3, which is 1. So what is delta equal to? 0 has to be equal to zero. So therefore, delta is equal to zero. If delta is not equal to zero, then this point in our equilibrium, our continuum, is not in equilibrium. So that's the key here. When you guys get your equations, you can substitute anything you want, any point you want, to ensure that it is in equilibrium. So if that's the case, and I know that delta is equal to zero, what is gamma equal to? Perfect. So from here, we know that gamma must also be equal to zero. If I were to scroll up to the top, we had alpha is equal to negative delta. What's delta equal to? So what's alpha equal to? Zero. So alpha is equal to zero. So now we have three out of the four. And if we look over here, what is beta equal to? Zero. Beta is equal to zero. So that's going to be the trick to these types of questions. On your assignment this week, you guys won't need to utilize symmetry. You guys will be able to solve it all using uh, linear momentum. But you guys will have five unknowns, three equations. Again, the key here with these is you can substitute any point into these equations. It must still hold. So if you have x1, x2, x3, I would go x1 is 1, x2 is 0, x3 is 0. Solve for something. Then I would swap it around. x1 and x3 are 0, x2 is equal to 1. You guys can substitute any point. Okay, That's, that's the key here to equilibrium. Any questions about this? No?
Wonderful. So you guys are you guys are happy. We'll move on to the next one. So it says if the state of stress shown below is in equilibrium, I should say static equilibrium, determine the body forces vector. So I give you guys a nice equation, and all we're basically doing is going to our equilibrium equations. I'm just going to rotate this a bit. Perfect. So all we're doing is solving for our body forces vector. So actually, let's see if I can just copy it. This probably won't work. Well, let's try. High risk, high reward. Copy. Perfect. Paste. Well, see that? Yes. Perfect. So we want static equilibrium, which basically means this term MA, it's zero. So all we're going to do is go down this equation. I guess I'll scroll up a little bit. Zoom in. All right, there we go. <clears throat> so partial sigma 1, 1 with respect to x1, what's that going to be equal to? 5. Say, so, okay, we got, I'll put equation 1 down here, I guess. We have 5 plus, what's partial sigma 2, 1, so this one right here, with respect to x2? 3x2, take the derivative out with respect to x2. What do we get? 3. So 5 plus 3. How about the last one? Partial sigma x3, I guess the derivative of x3 with respect to x3. Partial derivative of x3 with respect to x3. 1, exactly. Plus 1 plus our body forces, which we don't know, rho b1, and this of course is equal to zero. So if this is my equation, I only have one unknown, what is rho b equal to? What is rho b1 equal to? Exactly, rho b1 has to be equal to negative nine. Say, so, okay, that was equilibrium equation one, Right about equilibrium equation number two. So again, we're just going down this column now. What is the partial derivative of 3x2 with respect to x1? Zero. So we have zero plus, how about the partial derivative of 3x1 with respect to x2? Zero. And then the last component is zero, so we got zero plus zero plus rho b2 is equal to zero. So what is rho b2 equal to? Exactly. It's equal to zero. Now I'm not gonna go through it, I'm just gonna ask you guys, what is rho b3 equal to? Zero. The only derivative term is we have x3 with respect to x1, that's gonna be zero. So we have zero plus zero plus zero plus rho b3, equal to zero, so I'm just gonna come down here. Rho B3 is equal to zero. So my body forces vector, rho B, be equal to negative nine, zero, and zero. So how is that? How are you guys finding equilibrium? Who thinks it's pretty good? Who thinks it's Pretty crap. All right, everyone thinks it's pretty good. Let's change that. Question says the beam below is subjected to zero body forces and a horizontal force P. If sigma 1, 1 is the only non-zero stress component, determine two things. A differential equation of equilibrium, so that will scare you guys right off the bat, and sigma 1, 1 as a function of position. So our position is X. Starts at x equals zero, goes to x equals L, which is four. What do we do? So this is the ugly side of equilibrium. You guys are all happy. <laughs> Change that immediately. This is very similar to the assignment question, assignment five, the last question, question five, where basically we have to use equilibrium 
to determine stress distributions. Now the key to these questions, and it hints it right here, is when we do equilibrium, we are going to end up with the differential equation. So when we deal with these type of questions, two-step process. First is find the differential equation, and then the second part is solve it. Now, I'm not gonna solve it in class because I would never expect you guys to solve it by hand. You guys have Mathematica, and in the seminar I show you guys how to do that. Would I ever make you solve it in an exam? No, unless it's really simple. This differential equation, it's not going to be so simple. So the key thing here is sigma 1, 1 is our only stress component. So we're basically only dealing with the horizontal direction. Okay, that's the key here. We're dealing with the horizontal direction. And I said that we need to use equilibrium. So I know that this is a long shot. But I'm going to ask you guys because I trust you guys. Don't fail me. How do I get my equilibrium equation? Some of the forces, but on this free body diagram, where do I do my sum of the forces? Internal. Internal, sure. So do I cut it? So I just cut it right down the center and analyze this side. See, this is where it gets tricky. And this is where we have to look at our derivations. When I start off all my derivations, I always say we have a potato. But do I just cut the potato in half? What do I look at? infinitesimal little cube. And that's what we're going to do here. We are going to look at an infinitesimal slice. So I'm going to try and make a little rectangle. And it worked. I'm on my game today. We are going to look at this infinitesimal little slice. This is where our differential equation comes from. If we take a free body diagram of this slice, we will have our differential equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this slice right here has a thickness of dx. And I'm going to come down, and we're going to draw a free body diagram. So hopefully you guys have what you need. Uh, these examples that I do in class, they come directly from the quizzes. So if you guys are worried about writing them down, it's all in the quiz. Right? It's all in the quiz. So what I'm going to do is we're going to draw a free body diagram. Let's say that the slice, once it's blown up, it looks something like a trapezoid. And we have already said that we have a thickness dx. We have dx. So this is actually pretty simple. When we look at these things, think, think back to our equations of equilibrium. We basically had three components. We had stresses and their derivatives. We had body forces and we had accelerations. I started with a simple one. If it's in static equilibrium, is there going to be any accelerations? No. I say that there's no body forces. It says right in the question, if we were to scroll up, that there are no or zero body forces. So do I have body forces acting on my free body diagram? No. So what is going to be the only thing that changes throughout this that's going to be the only thing that I need to label on my diagram. Sigma. Exactly. Just the stresses. So what I'm going to do is say, okay, I know on one side I have sigma. And it says sigma 1, 1, but this is our only stress, so I'm just going to call it sigma. And then on the other side, of course, we have to have sigma. But is it just going to be sigma? Exactly. It's sigma plus the change in sigma with respect to x times that thickness dx. Am I missing anything? Am I missing anything? Let's, let's go up to the top. This is my original thing. Am I missing anything? Who thinks I'm good to go? Happy, happy, happy. Half a hand. <laughs> Who thinks I'm forgetting something? Who thinks I'm forgetting P? 
question for you guys. Does P act over here? Or does P act at the end? So should I include P right here? Tell me this. If I were to cut my beam, let's say that this is an inch 130, and I were to cut my beam, and I wanted to analyze this half, would I have P? No. Because I'm only analyzing this side. Of course, P would be in these reaction forces here. But if it's not acting directly on my free body diagram, I don't include it. So if I'm analyzing just this section here, are there any applied forces to that section? No. Well, that doesn't make sense. Clayton, What? why do we have P? Well, it'll become very apparent later. Well, actually, I'll tell you guys now because I can see you're so suspenseful. When we solve differential equations, do we need anything specific to help solve them? What happens when we solve differential equations? Math 201, what do you need to solve? Remember, differential equations involve integration. If I were to integrate something, you guys remember that plus C, that constant? Well, that's what's going to happen in differential equations. How do we solve for that constant? Boundary conditions. This P will become important later when we talk about boundary conditions. So we're going to go back down. We're going to say, okay, this is all we need. So if this is an equilibrium, if I were to take the sum of the forces in the horizontal direction, is that valid? Of course. Well, what's one thing I need to define before I do the summation of forces? Do I have forces here? Stresses. So how do I, what do I need to have to convert it into forces? Area, exactly. So what we're going to do is we are going to say that this side over here, this is going to be our area, and this side over here is going to be our area, plus our change in area with respect to x, times that thickness dx. Now with this, I have absolutely everything I need to take my summation of forces. So I'm just going to scroll down a little bit. I go summation of forces. And this is going to be equal to, we have sigma right here on the left-hand side. We have sigma times area. So we have sigma times area. But again, we have to account for the fact that it is going left direction. If it's going left, is it going to be positive or negative? Negative. So come down here, we say, okay, this, of course, is going to be negative. And then on the other side, we have sigma plus the change in sigma. Oops, just don't want change in area. The change in sigma dx times dx. And this is multiplied by its area, which is this yucky thing right there. So we're going to have the area plus the change in area. dx. And we know that, of course, this is going to be equal to zero if it's static equilibrium. So what would you guys do next? How would you guys approach this problem? How would you guys approach this problem? L equals four. L equals four, not quite yet. Actually, not quite yet. Should we expand this? Sure, that's, that's the answer I like to hear. Why, why not? All right, so we're gonna expand it. We have negative sigma times A, and then all I'm going to do is just factor in sigma to the two spots over on the other side over here. So we have sigma plus A. So you see how those are going to cancel out right away. And then we have plus sigma times the change in area with respect to x times dx. So that was my first one. Now I'm going to do the same thing as I just did. But instead of sigma, I'm going to do this partial sigma to both of the terms. So we're going to have plus a times uh, d sigma over dx 
times dx. And then our last term, which is the, probably the yuckiest, is d sigma over dx times dA over dx times dx squared. And of course, static equilibrium, this has to be equal to zero. Do some things cancel? Yes. Negative sigma times a plus sigma times a. So what we can do right away is we can get rid of these two. It almost follows the same procedure as we did for the proofs. What could be the next thing that we can do? Do all three of these terms that we have left share a common factor? dx. dx, dx, dx squared. So now I can factor out that dx. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to put in brackets. We now have sigma times the partial of a with respect to x. And then we have plus a partial sigma with respect to x. And then we have partial sigma partial x partial a partial x times dx. There's still a dx because it was dx squared. dx is equal to zero. Can I just get rid of this dx at the end? Yeah, I divide both sides by dx, zero divided by dx. Well, of course, that's going to be zero. So I can just get rid of this. So I'm left with this. And then this is where our mathematics needs to come into play. We have one problem in our equation. That is dx. This is good. This is good. These are fine. But then I have this. If I was properly deriving this, Think of integration. How big do I want dx? I wanted an exact solution. Infinitesimal. So I take the limit as dx approaches zero. So what's going to happen is this actually over here, that dx term, it goes away. And the reason why is because I take the limit as dx approaches zero. That's how I get my exact solution. So this is what we're left with right here. I'm going to scroll down a bit. And this is going to be our differential equation. We have sigma times dA with respect to dx plus a times d sigma with respect to x is equal to zero. This is our differential equation. What is my only unknown in this equation? going to be sigma. Well, Clayton, what about a? Well, we can define what a is. If I were to go back up to the top here, and we're given this right here, we're given two things. The height of this is going to be a function of x, and the depth, the in-plane depth, is just equal to 1. So we know that if I want the area, which is equal to basically base times height, well, this is going to be equal to 1 multiplied by the height, which is 4 minus x squared over 50. And, of course, just multiply by 1, we have 4 minus x squared over 50. So this is my area. I'm just going to bring it down here, and we're going to write it. We have our differential equation. We know that our area is equal to 4 minus x squared over 50. If I have the area, which was this term right here, can I find this term? The change in area with respect to x. Yes. All I need to do is just take the derivative of this term right here. So I come down here and say, okay, the change in area with respect to x it's just going to be the derivative of the function above. So what's the derivative of 4 with respect to x? 0. What's the derivative of negative x squared divided by 50 with respect to x? 
negative x over 25. So now we can take both of these identities, and I'll actually just move this one over to the side to create some room. We can take both of these identities and substitute them in to get this equation. We have sigma multiplied by the derivative of area, which is negative x over 50, plus the area, which we know is 4 minus x squared over 50, I realize that I need to switch that to 25, uh, multiplied by d sigma over dx is equal to zero. So I'll just switch this down here. So this is going to be our differential equation. Now, if you guys were to define this in Mathematica, use the d solve function, which is what we use to solve these, it will solve it. The only problem you will see is that you will have constant. You'll say C1. It's undefined because you need a boundary condition. Now, here's the trick to boundary conditions. If we're dealing with stress, should our boundary condition also be related to stress? What do you guys think? Because if I were to look up top here, I have two scenarios. I have the stress at one side. But I also have the displacement. We know that there's going to be no displacement here. So what would I define? Would I define the one dealing with stress or the one dealing with displacement? It's getting tricky now. What do you guys think? Who thinks displacement? Who thinks stress? It's stress. Whatever differential equation you're solving for, so in this case stress, our boundary condition must also be related to stress. Okay, there's, there's the key. We're gonna talk more about that later. So I say, okay, here's my differential equation. I can't solve it, but I know that the stress at X is equal to L, it's just going to be P, which we know is one, divided by the area at X is equal to L. So if we go here, we know the area is 4 minus x squared, while x, when x is equal to l, is 4 squared, because l is equal to 4, divided by 50. And we know that p, in this particular case, is equal to 1. And when you guys substitute the numbers, this is equal to 3.68. So all you guys would do in Mathematica is to find your differential equation, which would be this. And then you guys would say, well, this stress at x equals L is equal to this. And Mathematica will solve it, and it'll give you the differential equation. It's not going to be too bad. We're going to do lots of examples with differential equations because that's going to be the main thing after constitutive laws. We start dealing with beams. All right. So that's really it for this example. How are you guys feeling now? Good. Class makes you feel alive. Yeah, so this is where it does get a little bit extreme, but this is probably one of the worst jumps from equilibrium to differential equations. When we start talking about beams, they follow a very nice differential equation. It's not like this where it's kind of gross. Beams are much simpler, much simpler. All right, so that's really it for this lecture. You guys get, get out a little bit early, I guess. Uh, let me know if you guys have any questions about this or the assignments. I'm happy to answer all of them. All right. You guys have a wonderful day.